This episode is brought to you by The Jordan Harbinger Show. Do you want a new podcast to look forward to each week? One that's got it all, entertainment, information, and stuffed with actionable content? Yeah, you do. Because who wouldn't want to listen in as Jordan dives into the minds of fascinating people from athletes, authors, and scientists to mobsters and spies? Each week, Jordan uses his interviewing talents to bring you never-before-heard stories and insights to make life more understandable. He has one of the most highly rated self-development shows out there. Listen in, learn, and look forward to each new episode, like I do. And I would like to recommend a few episodes myself. The first one is episode 650, Brian Kloss, The Corruptible Influence of Power, and the other one is episode 585 with Timothy Snyder, 20th Century Lessons on Tyranny. Check them both out. You can't go wrong with adding the Jordan Harbinger show to your rotation. It's incredibly interesting. There's never a dull show. Search for the Jordan Harbinger show. That's H-A-R-B as in boy, I-N as in Nancy, G-E-R, on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you listen to podcasts. Welcome to Pax Britannica. Season 2, Episode 45 Before They Are Hanged Welcome back to Pax Britannica. I'm your host, Samuel Hume. Before we begin today... I'd like to thank my Patreon House of Lords, which has been joined by the Earl of Kennington, Tom McCool, and Baroness Marga. Like all of the patrons, they can now listen to this and every other episode ad-free. Go to patreon.com slash Pax Britannica to find out more. Last week, we saw Matthew Hopkins and John Stern spread their witch hunt into the county of Suffolk. It was around this point that Hopkins began styling himself as the Witchfinder General, at least partly to shore up his shaky legitimacy. Because even back in Essex, the two men were stretching the limits of Stern's warrant. As we also saw last week, the witchfinders were starting to face opposition. Hopkins and his searchers were expelled from a Suffolk parish after a local gentry family intervened, saving at least one woman from the noose. But now the witchfinders were summoned back to Essex. The Summer Assizes, the regular courts which dispensed justice in the English legal system, was soon to be in session, and Hopkins and Stern were both required to testify. On trial for their lives were 29 women accused of witchcraft, and the Colchester Six were among them. As we covered when we started this little mini-series on the Hopkins witch panic, One of the reasons that these trials escalated so greatly and with so much bloodshed was the breakdown of traditional legal institutions due to the Civil War. The threat of the King's army moving into East Anglia meant that the usual circuit judges stayed away, and the local authority of the Earl of Warwick took on the commission to dispense justice. He was no lawyer, and he had only a limited understanding of the judicial process. This would have devastating consequences for those on trial. With the Assizes beginning on the 17th of July, work began in earnest. The prisoners in Colchester Castle were brought out of the dungeons, some of them having not seen the sun for four months. These included Anne West, mother of Rebecca, who had herself taken Hopkins' offer of immunity in return for testimony, and Elizabeth Clark, the case that began this all. They were joined by 27 others, along with an extra dozen more mundane criminals. All were herded onto carts and transported to Chelmsford, some 24 miles away. The scale of the trial was vast. Joining Hopkins and Stern were their six search women, and at least 90 witnesses ready and willing to give evidence against their neighbours. The venue for the trials, Shire House, was filled to bursting. 
with the courtyard outside thronging with spectators. Those inside and out shared bread and wine together, discussing the suspects of the trial and debating their chances. Just as punishments were the subject of entertainment, so too were the trials, however morbid it might seem to modern ears. The crier called for order, and the sheriff and his clerks took their places before the dock. The justices of the peace, Grimston and Bowes, stood at the very front, while behind them were arraigned the gentry and the jurors. The six judges came in, with Warwick at their centre, while a clerk read out the parliamentary commission to dispense justice. Warwick reminded the jurors of their duty, and listed the charges they would be deliberating, including at least 50 charges of witchcraft, before court was adjourned for the jury to consider the pile of witness statements and confessions that had been laid out before them. When the court reconvened, the first batch of prisoners was brought in. Of them, 29 were women on charges of witchcraft. Among these were the Manningtree, or Colchester Six, now five, now that Rebecca West had made her deal. The first five witches were read their charges, and all five pled not guilty. What followed was not a calm and collected trial as we might think of. Instead, imagine a pantomime, with the crowd jeering and cheering, and sometimes throwing things, the judges attempting to keep order, the jurors trying to hear the testimony over the noise. The first trial to be resolved was that of Rebecca Jones of St. Osyth. She had denied any wrongdoing, but after the testimony of multiple witnesses, including the search women, and the reading out of her own signed confession, her hopes were dashed. She was led away to await the verdict, as Elizabeth Clark shuffled on her one leg to the bar. A young gentleman was called to testify, and Matthew Hopkins took the stand with all the self-confidence and zealotry that the Witchfinder General possessed. Here, Hopkins performed. He recounted Widow Clark's confession on that night just months ago, listing the names she had called her multiple imps, relishing the horrified cries of the crowd as he described Clark's first encounter with the devil. To some in attendance, his tale was quite obviously fiction. To others, well, it was just too fantastical to be invented. Stern then took the stand, confirming his colleague's account, and Richard Edwards then described the strange death of his son. All three men testified against Anne Leach, although they did not do so for the remaining two defendants. They didn't have to. Their searchers did that job for them, and after the assured guilt of Clark, Jones, and Leach, the others on the stand had little defence. The result was clear. Guilty on all counts. There was only one sentence that could be passed. The women, now convicted witches, were to be hanged by the neck until dead. They were led away, back to the jail to await their fate, as the next batch was marched past them to the bar. The remaining suspects faced the same fate. Anne West's betrayal by her own daughter was startling to the court, a sign of how evil her mother must have truly been, and, as the pamphleteers were keen on pointing out, an interesting parallel to the country's own opposition to its father, King Charles. Only one of the 29 suspected witches was acquitted. For many, their convictions were based not on any physical harm caused by their acts, but rather just their conjuration of evil spirits, a marked difference to previous, less extensive, English witch trials. One of those in attendance was the Earl of Warwick's steward, Arthur Wilson, who was not at all impressed by the events he had witnessed. He later wrote that he still, quote, could find nothing in the evidence that did sway me to think them other than poor, melancholy, envious, mischievous, ill-disposed, ill-dieted, atrabilious constitutions, whose fancies working by gross fumes and vapours might make the imagination ready to take any impression whereby their anger and envy might vent itself into such expressions as the hearers of their confessions that gave evidence might find cause to believe that they were such people as they blazoned themselves to be. End quote. Wilson is a bit wordy there, but the gist is that he saw the convicted women not as witches, but as people who felt spurned by society and so spurned it right back, or who were physically or mentally unwell, who had their words and deeds misconstrued 
or who had convinced themselves that they were, in fact, guilty of the crimes they were accused of. He was not the only sceptical voice. After the proceedings were declared over, half a dozen magistrates approached Warwick and begged reprieve for nine of the convicted witches, while others also requested clemency for those whose cases seemed the most flimsy. Warwick granted a number of these, and requests were made to Parliament stating that the court was not fully content with the evidence presented for many of those convicted, and that they were worthy of mercy. Eventually, nine of the witches were reprieved. Eight of these had been convicted solely for conjurations, not any kind of physical harm. The objections themselves may have been raised in part out of the opposition to the efforts of Stern and Hopkins. Evidence of this can be surmised from the fact that none of those witches granted mercy were from Manningtree and its immediate surroundings. Here, the witch finders had the most allies, and it was here that their friendly magistrates, Grimston and Bowes, had spent the bulk of their efforts forming a watertight case. The next day, the 18th of July, 1645, Fifteen of the condemned were taken from their cell and brought to Chelmsford Market Square. An enormous and energetic crowd was waiting around the constructed gallows, cheering and jeering, just as they had when the sentences were read out. One witch, Margaret Moon, collapsed and died on the way, cheating the hangman. One report described her calling out that Satan had promised that she would never hang, and so this was his promise cruelly fulfilled. Elizabeth Clark couldn't handle the ladder on her own with just one leg, and so she was helped up onto the platform and physically held high enough for the noose to circle around her neck, which is considerate. The charges were read out, the judgments given, and the sentence was carried out. Fifteen women hanged as the crowd jeered on. Four of the condemned, including Anne West and Helen Clark, were transported back to Manningtree and suffered the same fate two weeks later. The nine reprieved women remained in Chelmsford jail while they waited for their pardons to be processed. This took five more months, and two of them would die due to the terrible conditions in the dungeon before the wheels of bureaucracy could save them. With the assizes complete, Warwick returned to London. Grimston and Bowes returned to their estates. Stern and Hopkins, though, could not rest. They set off for their next trial at Bury St Edmunds to testify against more enemies of God. Hi, I'm Nathaniel Lloyd, host of Historical Blindness, the podcast about historical myths and misconceptions. As a podcaster, I know the meaning of grinding. Anyone with a side hustle knows what I mean. We tend to feel like there's always something we should be doing, and there's a sense of guilt when you do anything just for fun. But just like the old truism that there's not much point to earning money if you never have time to spend it, the truth is that you've probably done enough on any given day to earn a little enjoyment. Lucky for you, mobile puzzle game Best Fiends is always there whenever you need a bit of fun or even just a little diversion from that endless grind. I'm only on level 142, but I can tell you that it is quite enjoyable to plan ahead, line up those items, and match them all. I recommend thinking strategically before you touch that screen, because it's more tricky than you might at first suspect. You'll have plenty of opportunity to develop your strategies, though, because this fun is endless, with new levels and new events and challenges all year. You've earned your fun time. Go to the App Store or Google Play to download Best Fiends for free. Plus, earn even more with $5 worth of in-game rewards when you reach level 5. That's friends without the R. Best Fiends. Hey everyone, Ray here. Imagine being the first to invent something or travel to lands that no one of your group has ever seen before. That's the story that American history tellers from Wondery wants to share with you. Kind of like the original Star Trek, President Thomas Jefferson in 1804 hired Meriwether Lewis and William Clark to head west into the great unknown, the undiscovered country, to find an all-water route to the Pacific Ocean. 
and though they did not find that waterway, they did come across and record previously unknown plants and animals, not to mention coming into contact with deadly diseases while surviving harsh weather. And as they made their way west, it would be the Native Americans in the Rocky Mountains that were stunned to see white men for the first time. But getting to the Pacific and back would take all their skills and strength, not to mention a huge chunk of luck. And of course, one young native lady called Sacagawea, who saved the explorer's journals from a raging river and kept them from starvation, all the while carrying her own baby. Follow along as the American history tellers unfolds the story of these two men, their trials of facing mountain ranges, grizzly bears, and hostile natives. But more than discovery, their expedition was about who owned the American Northwest. All this and more is covered by the prolific and ever-engaging Lindsey Graham as he takes you along the imperfect paths ever westward, right alongside Lewis and Clark. So join American history tellers as they investigate how bravery, leadership, and luck helped these adventurers overcome impossible odds. Listen to American history tellers Lewis and Clark on Apple Podcasts, Amazon Music, or you can listen ad-free by joining Wondery Plus in the Wondery app. In the parish of Brandeston, all was not well. The secular authority, the lord of the manor John Revett, had semi-willingly left the area because of his royalist sympathies. The spiritual leader, John Lowes, the vicar, he was there, but he was certainly not popular. He'd been in his position since 1595, and had repeatedly been censured by the church for deviating from the Elizabethan settlement, and probably more towards Catholicism than Presbyterianism. His sermons were unpopular, his tithes excessive, He had his church renovated in his preferred style, naturally paying for this work from the parish coffers. He was a, quote, turbulent spirit, and had a, quote, multitude of vexations. When he was obstructed in his business, he took his opponents to court. At one point, the village petitioned for Lowe's to be recognised by the law as a repeated breacher of the peace, and demanded that charges be brought. Lowe's disputed the fairness of this, and London came to his rescue. This naturally did nothing to help with communal tensions. Shortly after this, around 1615, a local woman was accused of being a witch. Lowe's dismissed the claims as ridiculous, groundless, and superstitious, declaring that she was no more a witch than him, which might not have been a sensible claim to make to a community that already considered him a heretic and a papist. Many people in the parish took this as a confession when Lowe's took the suspected witch into protective custody. This only worsened the situation, and a mob descended on his home. The vicar met the mob at the door and denied that the woman was with him, but when his house was stormed, the woman was found and taken for trial. Lowe's, to his credit, was livid and berated and threatened his parishioners for their superstition and false accusations. He had his brother pay the woman's bail, but in February 1615, the woman was found guilty of murder by witchcraft and hanged. Lowe's vocal defence of a condemned witch was fresh in everyone's mind when the cattle and family members of witnesses began to fall sick and die. Rumours began to spread that Lowe's was himself diabolical. The vicar took one of his accusers to court for slander, while at the same time that accuser took him to court for witchcraft. Lowe's won both cases. His slanderer was made to pay damages, but this was not the end of his problems. For the next 20 years, Lowe's was effectively at war with his parishioners. They struggled with him in both the secular and ecclesiastical courts. He hit back with slander charges and, once, Star Chamber. Back and forth it went, until the parishioners hit out in the greatest court of all. The Court of Public Opinion. They published a pamphlet, a magazine of scandal, which spread far and wide and told tall tales of Lowe's degenerate and heretical life. Whether Hopkins read this or not is unknown, but he made his appearance in Brandeston shortly after its publication, arriving in the summer of 1645. 
What followed was as you'd expect. Lowe's parishioners came forward with claims about the magical crimes the vicar had committed. Matters were not helped by his apparent connection to a witch from nearby Framlingham, who told her captors that Lowe's was the leader of her sect. The vicar was stripped and searched for teats and marks. These were found, and then the septuagenarian was subjected to the watching, kept awake for, quote, several days and nights together, end quote. Hopkins had developed this method since Manningtree. Now suspects were made to exercise, to tire them out quicker. It should be said that the account of his treatment comes from the record of the Lord of the Manor, John Revit, who returned after the Restoration and inquired about Lowe's fate. So it is possible that Revit exaggerated the actions of his rebellious tenants. Saying this, however, everything he writes is similar to other interrogations committed by the Witchfinders, and they're backed up by the parish records. So even if it were invented or embellished, it isn't entirely unbelievable. Despite all of this, Lowe's held his tongue. He refused to confess to crimes that he hadn't committed, and so the Witchfinder General ordered him to be taken to Framlingham Castle, where he would be dunked in the moat. Lowe's was duly thrown in, and unfortunately for him, he floated, proving his guilt. Lowe's, who, just to remind you, was almost 80 years old, had been deprived of sleep for days, and was just brutally thrown into a stagnant moat. Finally, he broke. He confessed to feeding imps from teats on his head and under his tongue, but denied making a contract with the devil. He also confessed that he used imps to kill cattle and sink ships. Lowe's was then taken to a magistrate who recorded this information and sent the vicar onto Ipswich Jail. The witch hunt had now spread north into Norfolk on the orders of zealous parliamentarians and with a little involvement from the witchfinders. Details are slim, but possibly 40 witches were arrested and around 20 hanged. Judging by the location, as they were all in the southern reaches of Norfolk, it is possible that Hopkins played some role in starting some of the trials at the very least. Contrary to this apparent expansion in the witch hunt, fears over the war effort meant that a number of jails and dungeons were emptied of prisoners through pardons. They were an expense that was hard to bear, and a security risk that was too great to take. Ipswich Jail was not one of these. Here, a newspaper report described that at least 38 witches were being held in the jail. The jailer began taking entry fees from excited locals who toured the cells to ogle at the caged witches, like some kind of magical zoo. Rumours began to circulate that the reason for so many arrests was that Matthew Hopkins had come into the possession of the Devil's Book, a very helpful, convenient register of all of his servants across the Kingdom of England. The war of words between royalists and parliamentarian propagandists flared up over the subject of witches. Royalists ridiculed the fact that a staunchly Puritan region like East Anglia was apparently overflowing with the servants of the devil. Puritans hit back by arguing that it was because of their righteous cause and their strong faith that the devil had targeted them. Parliament was becoming increasingly concerned about the goings-on in East Anglia. At first, the Commission for the Suffolk Assize was drawn up as normal on the 24th of July. 27 men, including magistrates and aristocracy, were to be headed by the Sergeant-at-Law, John Godbold, a veteran of the Suffolk Sessions for many years. However, Parliament received a worrying report about quite how many people were being charged with witchcraft and what type of people. I mean, for goodness sake, they want to string up priests. It was, quote, as if some busy men had made use of some ill arts to extort such confession from them, end quote. So instead of the usual procedure, much like the Essex Assize, the Suffolk Assize broke from tradition, though in a vastly different way. Instead of the usual process, and instead of sending a military man, Parliament granted a special commission of Oye and Termine, or to hear and determine, an ancient legal tool meant to allow quick and decisive action, usually to resolve riots or rebellion, sparks that could spread to something more serious 
and which had to be damped down decisively. Clearly, Parliament was concerned that this witch panic could spread. Godbold was chosen to lead this, and he was dispatched at the head of two clergymen, Edmund Calamy and Samuel Fairclough, and the three men left a good month earlier than they needed to. They weren't going into this blind. Together, the three men spent the time touring the county, mirroring the actions of Hopkins and Stern, visiting the jails and dungeons where witches were being held. The conditions in Suffolk were no better than in Essex, and bubonic plague and tuberculosis were rife. It is clear that the commission was attempting to fully understand the cases. So, on Tuesday, the 26th of August, the prisoners of Ipswich were carted to Bury St Edmunds. There were so many, possibly over 150, that a barn had to be requisitioned to house them. Fairclough gave two sermons to mark the beginning of the session. The first to remind those present that witchcraft was both a very real and heinous crime. The second warned against false convictions. Godbold then addressed the jury to remember three things. One, witchcraft was incredibly difficult to prove without a confession. Two, that confessions must be voluntary and sincere. And three, that there was good reason to believe that many of the confessions they were going to hear were nothing of the sort. If Stern was in the crowd, as is suspected, he may have realised that this trial was not going to go as well as the Essex one. The business of the Assizes began. The jury considered the cases, some were dismissed out of hand, some were held over for the next session the next day. Then the trial proper began, and witnesses were called. Among them were the two witchfinders, Hopkins and Stern. This did not go well for them. Several of their cases had already been thrown out, and others were in line for acquittal. Stern was furious when one of his witches denied her previous confession. Quote, she never confessed anymore, but denied what she had former confessed. Stern had further slices of humble pie. Alexander Sussums, the man he indicted for witchcraft last episode, repeated his confession, only to be acquitted. One of Hopkins' witches was, however, found guilty and sentenced to hang. Lowe's, the vicar, was also found guilty and condemned. In all, at the end of the first day of proceedings, 16 women and two men were found guilty and sentenced to death. The remaining cases were to be tried the next day. That day never came. The war, as always, had interfered. The proximity of the king's army spooked the magistrates, and they decided that the session was to be postponed for the foreseeable future. They still had enough time to squeeze in a few hangings, so those who had been condemned that day would die the next. They were led back to the barn in chains. Guarded throughout the night, the condemned swore a vow not to confess further and to request forgiveness on the gallows, but one of the women refused to take part in the pact. The market square of Bury St Edmunds was crowded. That day, the 27th of July 1645, was a day of humiliation dedicated to fasting and the absence of any activity other than God's work. This naturally included going to church, but it also included the punishment of God's enemies. And executions were always a source of entertainment, and the men and women who were led to the gallows did so amid the jeers of the crowd. The one woman who had refused to make the same vow as her colleagues made her apologies, disavowed her compatriots, and revealed their secret pact but it changed nothing. The charges were read out, and the shackles on the prisoner's feet were removed. The first to die ascended the steps, the noose was placed around their neck, and the ladder was removed. The drop was enough to tighten the rope, but not to snap the neck and grant a quick death. And so, in what must have been a horrifying experience, the condemned were left faintly thrashing as the line of prisoners took their places and one by one joined them. Lowe's, the man of God condemned for being a servant of Satan, made a final request to conduct his own funeral service from the Book of Common Prayer. This was allowed, and once he finished speaking, the noose was placed around his neck, and he took the short drop. You could say that John Lowe's, vicar of Brandiston, was one of the very few people who have attended their own funeral. Next week, 
we will finish our mini-series on the Witchfinder General, as his career ends not with a bang, but a whimper. Thank you to my House of Lords, including but not limited to the King's favourite Mike Sanders, the Duke of Clarence Rory Martin, the Marquis of Ludlow, Nick Robinson, and the Earl of Caithness, Lou Hartman. Remember that every patron, regardless of rank, receives an RSS feed, which you can put in any podcast app to listen to the podcast ad-free, and a little bit early. Thank you to everyone who has supported me on Patreon, or donated through PayPal, left a review, or told a friend about the podcast. Thank you to Sounds Like an Earful for the interval music used in today's episode, to my entire House of Lords, and to you for listening.